This is the Mark Dolan Way. Top tips for mind, body and soul, some great life hacks and my favourite products of the week. This show is available on all podcast platforms or you can watch it. Just subscribe to the Mark Dolan Way on YouTube and join the Facebook group. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show. Three words that will change your life. Do difficult things. If you develop an appetite for doing hard things, doing jobs that others don't want to do, you will be in the top 5% of the population. And the reason why is because it's in our nature to seek the easy solution. It's in our nature to cut corners. Uh, Basically, the survival blueprint involves being efficient with energy and resources. That is how we have prevailed as a species. Um, And all creatures will look for the low-hanging fruit. Uh, Predatorial animals will will hunt um, the weakest prey. And, you know, you've watched those nature documentaries when the, the little deer that's got a bad leg gets caught by the tiger. The tiger doesn't go after the strong, fast deer. It takes the easy option. So in this hyper competitive world, if you go the other way and seek out the hard tasks, so whether it's a job at work that no one else wants to do, there's some task and there doesn't seem to be an answer and it's complicated and it's a nightmare and people have struggled with this issue. Your colleagues have just said, I cannot fix this. Make yourself the person to own that problem and find a solution. And the reason why is it will set you Um, apart from all of your colleagues slash rivals. So in the end, I would suggest statistically that if you go for difficult things and develop an appetite for hard things, you're probably in the top 5% of the population because it is just what we do as a species is we look for the easy option. So why don't you look for the hard one? And it's interesting, isn't it? My wife has this lovely catchphrase. She always says um, that she likes to put stones in her path. So the idea is that you're, you're walking along this metaphorical path. It's a little too smooth. So it will be better for you if there are stones in the way, because you've got to kind of navigate those stones and not slip over and not stub your toe and not trip over the stone. And of course, the stones are going to use energy and diminish your resources. So you're deliberately making harder life harder for yourself by putting stones in your way. So that's an upgrade to do difficult things is is actually to put a spanner in the works. Okay, create resistance, friction in order to make it even harder what you're doing. And again, the reason why you'll do that is because it puts you ahead of the pack. It separates you from everybody else. An appetite for hard work and for problems is a superpower. Let me quote Jerry Seinfeld, who is a workaholic comedian, a billionaire and an extraordinary artist. And one aspect of uh, his success is that he is very conscientious. He's very consistent. He's stubbornly hardworking. Um, He's committed to his craft, committed to his gift. And he writes every day. Now, writing comedy is the hardest thing. Um, It's interesting when you when you look at comedy, many people think it's a craft in terms of performance. It's like you've really got to work on being a great live comedian. Jerry Seinfeld's view is that the work is done with the notepad and on the laptop, not at the gig, but just during the day on those rainy Tuesday afternoons when you're just working out your material. So he works every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. He's working on his material and he's chosen a job which is very hard, which is to be a stand up comedian. Essentially, people have been have paid you to make them laugh, which is kind of like an intellectual prostitution, isn't it? You're there to give the customers a good time. But you can only be successful in a job like that if you have an appetite for difficult work. Being a stand up comedian is pretty obvious and that's a hard thing to do. Um, but he's done very well out of it. And it, it's just, it, it, it is what people do. You know, if, if, if people are kind of uh, looking at job options, they'll be like, well, wait a minute, what, what's what's the easiest job for the, for the most money? That's fine. That's what everyone else is doing. But why don't you just go for like the hardest job? The reason is that in the end, if you can offer to an employer solutions to work issues that others can't, you're going to get paid more money. So the worker that 
essentially doesn't see problems, only solutions, and enjoys the pain and the hard work and the blood, sweat and toil of issues that others walk away from, well, then you have a premium. You know, you have a marketable resource there. Um, so let's say that you're in the office and there's a problem with the client and it doesn't seem like it can be fixed. It's like, well, let's let's get Susan onto this because Susan likes a challenge. She's the 5% of this company uh, that will embrace the issue that the others say cannot be fixed. And by the way, do not let anyone ever tell you that anything cannot be fixed, that anything is unresolved. Um, I grew up in the 80s. They said the, the Northern Ireland conflict, the IRA, terrorism, all of that, that, that there was no solution to that. Well, we had the Good Friday Belfast Agreement and we have a, a hard won peace. Anything can be resolved, but it's going to be by those people that have an appetite for resistance. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, be best friends with your pain. OK, so you just embrace pain as a partner in your life. OK, not as an unfortunate consequence, but literally as a collaborator, as your greatest asset, pain. Anyway, I didn't give you the Seinfeld quote. So the Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld quote is uh, he said, find the torture that you're comfortable with. OK, and that ties in for him. Obviously, as I mentioned, writing comedy, it's not easy. Otherwise, everyone would do it. Imagine getting paid a lot of money just to tell jokes for 20 minutes every night. It's pretty nice, isn't it? It's a pretty good gig. But uh, it's because the writing of the jokes is the hard bit. So I love that. Find the torture that you're comfortable with. The appetite for difficult stuff can be extended to relationships. So very much in a, in a work context, Something else that will set you apart from others is your ability to get on with difficult people and to be productive and collaborative with difficult people. Now, there are difficult people out there. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist or, or any of those things or a psychologist. That is not my area of expertise. I mean, I'm very interested in people and I've always been a reader of people, but I'm not qualified. But I think we can all, all agree that there is such a thing as a difficult person. Oh, wouldn't you say that there are difficult people out there? Uh, we all know difficult people. We, we are related to certain difficult people. We work with certain difficult people. We might encounter a difficult person on the bus and we, we're lucky that they're not in our lives. And we count our blessing that that very strange man on the bus is not, um, is not in our inner circle. But the issue is, that when it comes to work, especially family, but also work, you can't choose who's around you. And there will always be difficult people. Even if you're the boss of the company, you're still going to have some employees who are difficult. You can't fire all the difficult people. Um, a really, really good recruitment strategy would involve weeding out the difficult people because they're offering, um, you know, possibly they bring politics into the office Maybe they're unproductive, they upset other people, they, 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 they impact the well-being of, of the business, right? That's fine. So you, you, let's say you're running a company for 10 years. You, you, you inherit 100 people who are your staff. And over 10 years, you, you just say, you, you slowly get rid of the crap people, but also weeding out the difficult people. Uh, the ones who sow division, who bitch about people, who are two-faced, all of that impact morale. But you'll never completely eliminate the difficult people. Even if you are the most powerful CEO in the world, there will be people in the team who are just a, what I would call, and it's a technical term, a pain in the ass. OK, now what happens is that most people, they give up with the difficult characters. Uh, they they will go on strike. It's like, I'm not working with Eddie. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm actually moving my desk to the other side of the office because I just have no time for this guy. Um, maybe you're fighting all the time with a difficult person. Maybe that difficult person is causing you such stress that you're off, you're off work and you're sick. You've got mental health issues because of bloody Eddie, Eddie in accounts, who we all know is a pain in the ass. So everybody avoids dealing with it and just tries to sort of exist in parallel with these difficult people. Well, as I said to you earlier, you do difficult things. So if there are tasks that others don't want to do, which are the hardest thing, 
You make yourself the president of that task. You know the thing everyone hates? I'll do it. I will do it and I'll own it and judge me on whether I've solved the issue. We'll do the same with people. So find the difficult people in the office and make your relationship with them a colossal success. It's amazing. It takes patience. It's not equal, okay? If you make it work with a difficult person, you're the one that has to be self-disciplined. You've got to control your emotions. You have to be very tolerant. And you indulge them being a pain in the ass with the wider goal that will get the best out of this difficult person by making that relationship work. So make the relationship work with difficult people. So have a think now, just for a moment, of some difficult people at work who no one likes. And just have a think about, you know, so identify who that is. And when you're next working, um, I want you to see how you can love bomb that person and recalibrate that relationship and look at any positives that they may have and overcome the negatives. So let's say we've got Eddie in accounts and he's rude, he's shouty, he's got a temper, uh, he's lazy. He's always late, right? Doesn't sound great, does it? But what he's really good at doing is number crunching. He's he's fantastic when it comes to uh, data analysis and spreadsheets, but he's still late and he's still rude and he steals other people's lunch from the fridge, okay? He's one of those guys that in the office, he opens the milk, smells it with his disgusting, dirty, snotty nose, then drinks from the mouth of the bottle, puts the lid back on and puts it back in the fridge, okay? Or he sees um he sees one sausage left in the fridge, which you know you've been looking forward to. That's you know there's a sausage left in the fridge. And he goes and eats it, doesn't tell anyone. So he's a nightmare. And everyone's given up on Eddie. Well, make Eddie your project because this guy crunches the numbers. And he's really good at it. And it's worth the sausage theft. And it's worth the milk contamination. And it's worth the lateness because of some of the things that he does bring. If Eddie is completely useless or in no positives, then forget it. Okay, I'm talking about difficult people that do have some attribute, some potential. And honestly, exactly the same as being the person that's willing to do difficult things. If you're willing to engage with difficult people, that is another superpower because it would be like, oh, yeah, you know, um. Susan's really good with it. Susan's really made it work with Eddie. Everyone hates Eddie, but Eddie bloody loves Susan. And he's delivering all this data for her. And it's really improved her department and her results. And I don't know how she does it. I don't know how she puts up with Eddie. She's even started bringing sausages in for Eddie because she knows he likes them so much. And semi-skimmed milk, which is his preferred dairy solution. So do you like that? Because I really like that. And I have, I've got to say, I've spent my life, I think making it work with difficult people. And when there are difficult people, I just see it as a challenge. You know, I find it an intellectual challenge. It's an emotional challenge. On a previous show, I talked to you about a brilliant book, which I'd highly recommend you read or listen to the audiobook version of, which is called The Chimp Paradox by Professor Steve Peters. Really like that uh, book. And in that book, it's all about your emotional management. So if you want to have a full debrief, go back to that episode. It's the Chimp Paradox episode of, of the show. I think it's, it's uh, what do you know what? Shall I give you, let me give you the exact, uh, let me give you the exact episode number. Yeah, episode five, podcast episode five, I explain the Chimp Paradox. But it's all to do with um, helping you manage your emotions in order to have a happier, more successful life. And when it comes to making it work with difficult people, um, you're essentially, because the chimp paradox says that you've got little chimpanzee monkey in your head and it's your emotional brain. And your job is to train that chimp so that the chimp works for you, not against you. And it just means that when something happens in your life, you don't panic. You don't suddenly think the world's going to end. You sort of talk to your chimp mentally and you're like, it's going to be okay. You'll be all right. The world's not going to end. So you've got to sort of train up. Basically, you train your emotions. That's really what it is put crudely. Well, when it comes to making it work with difficult people, uh, your job is to work with their chimp. Okay. And so let's say that Eddie is very temperamental, he loses his temper, then you start to identify the, the things that make him angry and you stop doing those things. 
because we want to get the best out of him. We know that Eddie is so good with those numbers. I want him to concentrate on that. So you tolerate the sausage theft, maybe make a joke about it because perhaps he's got a sense of humour. And you tolerate the lateness because you know that when he does come, you know, he's good with a calculator. He's and spreadsheets, Excel. I, I know nothing about this technology. I'm really sorry. I'm not a, not a software person. But um, what you're doing is you're identifying his emotions. And essentially, you're, you're almost manipulating him to make the relationship work. And it's not a two-way thing, right? So you've accepted that, that he's annoying and it's not going to be equal, but you will tolerate his quirks in order, out of self-interest really, for, for, so that you can exploit what he has to offer and you, you put up with it. I mean, put crudely, think about it like this. Imagine a football manager that's signed Cristiano Ronaldo, right? And maybe Cristiano Ronaldo is just a nightmare and the whole team hate him, but then he scores goals, doesn't he? So is a manager going to let Cristiano Ronaldo leave the team just because he's a pain in the ass? No, you're going to accommodate Cristiano Ronaldo because you want those goals, because you want to win the league and you want to win cups. And you're going to just somehow make it work with this nightmare human being. You see it in showbiz, right? These big stars and they're a nightmare to work with. Awful. But they do the numbers. They do the numbers, baby. Jeremy Clarkson, curmudgeonly man, very talented, probably quite difficult to work with. But he's got the Midas touch with the viewers. They love him. You've got to make it work. Similarly, Tom Cruise, you know, I've interviewed Tom Cruise, very nice man, very focused. He really makes you feel like you're the most important person in the room. Um, complicated, difficult man, perfectionist, whatever. But you make it work because people will buy tickets to see a Tom Cruise movie. So actually, you know, when it comes to these stars, you know, that, that those are the difficult people that their colleagues make it work with. But um, everyone's got a certain talent. And so if, if there is a member of the team that everyone's given up on, see what you can do. And then what will happen is people will come up to you and they go, I can't believe how well you get on with Eddie. Now, Eddie's a nightmare, but he's brilliant with you. And, and he's really, he gives you all this work, all these printouts of the stuff and the company accounts are bulletproof. Um, you somehow get the best out of Eddie. We hate him. We barely talk to him. And they've failed and you've succeeded. And the reason why is because you've nurtured that relationship and you've embraced um, a difficult person and you've taken on that project. Let me tell you that this does not work privately. OK, so if this is your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband or your wife. And there are these characteristics that make them really difficult and you're having to bend over backwards and make yourself perfect in order to accommodate them being a nightmare. That's not an equal relationship. So I don't think it works in the realm of love. I don't think it works like that. I think, yes, you can be with someone that's difficult and, and you can also be the difficult person. Um, but it would have to be that both sides bend a little. OK, if you're if you're if you're married to Eddie, then. Eddie's got to learn to be on time, stop stealing milk and stop stealing sausages. But in a work situation, it doesn't, you don't have those demands. You don't have those expectations because you're really, your ambition is more cynical, which is the company's well-being, your department. And you, you suck it up, basically. You, you suck it up, but you do, don't do that in a relationship. So if Eddie can't change, if you're married to Eddie or going out with Eddie, and he can't and won't change and is resolutely difficult. And you're the one that's controlling your emotions and being patient and doing all the heavy lifting. That's bad. And you've got to give an ultimatum to Eddie, which is you change or I'm out of here. But it doesn't work like that in work. In work, you've got to have colleagues that you don't like. Let me tell you, in the world of television, I know several on-air partnerships. They can't stand each other, but they get great ratings. Who cares? You don't have to like your colleagues. You just have to deliver results with them and it will be noticed by senior management if you're one of those people that makes it work with Eddie in accounts. Now let me tell you something that's going to be very helpful in terms of your long-term goals. If there are key messages in this podcast that really work for you that you found very helpful I want you to revisit them regularly because here's the thing about wisdom it is not contained within the body and within the soul it passes through us. 
So that's why religious people, people of faith, Christians, Muslims, Jewish people, they go back to their scriptures sometimes every week. That's why church, for example, is a weekly occurrence to keep that messaging back. Always, always repeating, you know, the word of the Lord, as it were. Um, there are many religious people that that read their religious texts every day, twice a day. You probably can't go to this messaging often enough. Um, it's like vitamin C. Did you know that vitamin C is very good for you and it's not stored in the human body, which is why you have to have vitamin C every day. Vitamin C just passes through you. Your organs just excrete it. Other vitamins uh, are residual within the system for a few days, but the vitamin C does not stick around. Um, and wisdom is exactly the same. It passes through you. Um, so what I'd recommend is that if there have been certain podcasts that have helped you, take a note of some of that messaging, like my my three word solution today, do difficult things. Um, come back to it, you know, and, and what you'll find is that when you hear the podcast, it's a game changer. Your life is already better. And then you somehow plateau in a couple of months time, you're back to square one or back to your bad habits. Do not worry about that. It's because that message has dissipated. It's left you and you need to refresh. And it's a marvellous thing. So just imagine, just treat it like a theology. OK, if you're not a religious person, if you don't have faith, um, then put together your own little Bible of solutions and hacks and messages and words of wisdom that really work for you. Go back to it, revisit, revisit, revisit. Now I've got a fabulous physical hack for you. This will save you money, it will save the planet, and it will be fantastic for your mental and physical health. Cold showers, absolutely amazing. So I don't know when I started this. Um, somebody told me that it's good for you to have a cold shower at the end of your shower. So I would have my normal hot shower and then I'd have a cold blast at the end. At first I found it horrific, but I got used to it. I kind of got into it. And then one day, for some reason, I decided I'm just going to start cold and see what happens. That was about two years ago. And I've been having cold showers every ever since. I wouldn't honestly, uh, I've, I've never gone back. I, I would uh, never go back to the hot showers. OK, I th honestly think that's it for life. Um, so the trick with the cold shower is you should acclimatize yourself. So when the cold water comes on, you start with your feet and your hands and then your legs and your arms and then you get to your core. Uh, otherwise, it's a bit of a shock to the system if you start straight on your chest. Um, and the reason why it's really good, it's very refreshing. It obviously wakes you up in the morning. A cold shower is like a cup of coffee. Very stimulating for the organs. Excellent for the skin as well, because you're not stripping your skin of its oils in the way that you would with hot water and soap. So that's joyful and lovely. Um, and you're obviously not using any energy because it's cold water. So you're helping the environment and you're saving yourself energy bills. And I mean, I'd love to know what the calculation is, but by not having hot baths or hot showers for a year, I mean, that's got to save you a few quid, hasn't it? What, what do you reckon? I mean, 50, 60 pounds a year, maybe 100 pounds a year. So a year of cold showers and you feel great and your skin's great and you're glowing and you've got 100 pounds in your back pocket. And then you can just go and have dinner or something in a posh restaurant and have a great time. I mean, that's a return flight to continental Europe all because you had a cold shower. Um, and also in terms of your carbon footprint, that means that maybe you can you can take those carbon points and, and do something really naughty with them because you've earned it. So it's really, really nice. Um, one thing I would say is I do have one little winter cheat. I find it hard with the cold shower washing my hair. Because with that cold, icy water in the winter, you get like a headache, you get a brain freeze. I can't imagine it's great for your health either. So in the coldest winter months, um, I have a cold shower. But for rinsing the shampoo, I have lukewarm. I don't have hot, but I just have lukewarm, um, just enough to get the shampoo off and then back to cold again. And what's really nice is that actually in the winter when it is cold, um, the water itself is much colder. So it's incredibly bracing. 
I've actually found that in the summer, the cold showers are a bit disappointing. They're a bit mediocre because the water just isn't cold enough. And it's awful in hot countries because the cold water is almost lukewarm. That's horrific. There's no refreshment there. So the colder, the better. I remember staying with family in Stuttgart in the winter once. And for some reason, their water supply seems, seems to have been very deep in the ground because they had the coldest water I've ever witnessed. It was like ice cubes coming out of the shower hose. Absolutely loved it. I would have considered moving to Stuttgart just for the uh, access to such cold, cold water. Um, so do it. Honestly, do it. And I honestly, I don't think you'll be cold for hours later. The thing about the cold shower is you won't last long anyway. My cold showers are very quick. It's another advantage. They're not time consuming. I'll probably do 90 seconds, two minutes in the shower. That's all I need. Bit of soap under the arms, bit of soap in the nether regions, bit of shampoo on top. Happy days. Um, because I enjoy cold showers so much, I, I sometimes also just go in and have a cold shower without washing my hair and it's just refreshing and I don't need the shower but you're not using a huge amount of water because it's a minute or two <coughs> but it will make you feel great uh, so give it a go let me know how you get on but I think you'll find it's addictive now it's time for my product of the day which I'm very excited about and I'm going to tell you that if you're watching you'll be able to see it and if you're listening, I shall describe it. It is a pressure cooker. Now, what is a pressure cooker? Well, a pressure cooker is essentially a saucepan which cooks your food under pressure, under steam and water pressure. So this one is good because it's called a stovetop. It basically just goes on your hob and it works with gas, electricity, induction. Absolutely brilliant. And because it's a stovetop, there's no electronics. So it's very cheap. I think this one cost me 25, 30 pounds. And that is a device that will be with me forever. 25, 30 quid, unlimited dinners. And it will save you money and it will also save the planet and it will give you delicious food. So what it does, it is a saucepan and you put water into it okay so it's got a minimum and a maximum so if you put let's say i don't know a, a cup or two of water in there that's enough that's like a kind of base layer like a, an inch or two of water at the bottom of the saucepan and then if you take um let's say a piece of a piece of meat um on a previous show i talked about the joy of slow cooking and buying really really cheap tough meat and then cooking it slowly for a few hours and it becomes tender. Well, this is a perfect solution for really tough meat. So if you get a piece of brisket, which is um, very, very inexpensive and almost inedible if you don't pressure cook it, um, you, you put it in an inch of water, two inches of water. You close the pressure cooker lid. You put it on the saucepan and you bring it to the boil. And what happens is that as the water boils, the steam leaves the saucepan and there's a valve, which means that once all of the air has left the saucepan, the valve closes. It doesn't allow any new air in. It only lets air or, or steam out. So once there's no more air in, it closes. And in this particular device, you get a little red button that just pops up and it tells you that it's now pressurized. And then what you can do is you can turn the hob down um, a little bit because it doesn't need to be boiling. You see, once it's pressurized, it doesn't need as much power or heat anymore. So I'll bring it to the boil on full power and then I can just turn it down to gas mark num number three and it stays pressurized and then you leave it. If the little red button switches off, that means the pressure has dropped and air has come back in. So you just need enough power. So, you know, you might need number four or number five. It depends on your hob, but just enough to keep that button up. And then you can go off and, and that could be an hour, two hours. Because it's a stovetop, uh, don't leave the house when it's on. You should never leave anything cooking when you're not at home because that's a hazard and you could burn the house down or cause an accident. So don't do that. Uh, but it's such a simple device. 
And the reason why it will tenderize meat is because it cooks it under pressure. So it's intense. It means that it's much faster than normal cooking. So, for example, you can do a chicken in there. This is a great solution, by the way, a quick roast chicken. So let's imagine that it's 5 p.m. and you need a roast chicken like straight away. You know that in the oven, that's 90 minutes, isn't it? Well, in the pressure cooker, 15, 20 minutes will do it. I shit you not. So what you do is you drop the whole chicken, a complete raw chicken into the into the pressure cooker. You'd need a bigger one than this. Um, if it was a small one like this, you'd chop it up. But let's imagine you've got a bigger pressure cooker, a bigger saucepan. And the chicken goes in and then you have, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what would do it? I think maybe four or five centimeters of water at the bottom. Any herbs or anything? Any spices? Bit of salt, bit of pepper, garlic. You close the lid, get it pressurized. 20 minutes later, you've got a cooked chicken. Then what you do, if you want it having that roasted vibe, slam it in the oven for 15 minutes on a crazy high heat and that will brown it. Don't forget, once it comes out of the pressure cooker, it's done 15, 20 minutes in the pressure cooker. It has cooked. That's how potent it is. It is about three times quicker than conventional cooking, right? It is so futuristic. It is so speedy Gonzalez. And then you brown it for 15 minutes in, in the oven, the roast chicken. So that's a 30 minute roast chicken. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that brilliant? And here's the other great thing about pressure cooking a roast chicken. It won't be dry because a pressure cooker is a steamy environment. It's basically pressurized water, pressurized steam. Um, the other thing that's really good is a casserole. So let's imagine you've got some carrots, some sausages, a bit of stock, um, some cabbage, a few potatoes, you know, whatever it is. But you just throw it all into the pressure cooker, switch it on. Half an hour later, dinner is cooked. Absolutely amazing. And it's fantastic how soft it makes the meat. Um, the other lovely thing about the pressure cooker is it encourages casserole cooking. And casserole cooking is good because it's less waste. Because the whole point about a casserole is you just throw whatever you've got in the fridge into the pot, don't you? So imagine you've got some old celery, which has seen better days, or a tired onion. You just chuck it in, you know, or, or even a kind of unfriendly lump of meat that's just been inhabiting the freezer for years on end. Take it out. And of course, by the way, you know, the meat, frozen meat can just go into the pressure cooker. It will be defrosted in there within minutes and then it starts cooking. So it's just a win-win. Um, it will save you money for so many reasons. First of all, you use less energy because you're not heating up all of this air. It's pressurized. So it's very, very focused and it's less. Oops, that was a bit noisy, wasn't it? Um, it is, um, you know, you put you switch off these notifications, but they still come, don't they? Yeah, it, the, the, the stuff of joy. So uh, what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, I love it. It will change your life. And it will save you money and it will make delicious food. There's nothing you can't cook in the pressure cooker. Um, I've got a can't I can't lie. I have two pressure cookers. OK, I've got my budget stovetop and I've also got an instant pot, which is basically the same thing, but it's electric. And what that means is that you can set a timer and mine does up to two hours. So I will I will. That is a device I will leave on when I'm not at home. Now you do that at your own risk, obviously, but because it's electronic and it's got a timer on it, I can get a, a nice piece of meat, put it in there, set it for two hours. And I know that it will have switched off after two hours and it's going to be like dinner's ready. So that's amazing. You can go off to work in the morning, put all your casserole ingredients in, switch it on. You come home, dinner's ready. And the ele electronic one from Instant Pot is nice because it has a keep warm function. So it means when you get home, it's it's cooked. Absolutely spectacular. And with these casserole dishes, don't forget, um, you're getting all of the goodness of the food because it's all in the sauce. It's all in one place. You know, there's, you're not throwing anything away. And I would highly recommend it. So there you go. Um, that is the pressure cooker.
um, gift one to a friend. If you're not sure about the technology, why don't you borrow one and see how you get on with it? And if it's a success, then you go and get one yourself. Um, some of these stovetop ones can be a little wild. Um, and there are stories of pressure cookers exploding. So make sure that you read the instructions and that you buy quite an up-to-date one if you can. Um, the other thing is that when you switch them off, when you open the valve, it can be you can get a real powerful jet of steam. Do not let kids anywhere near them. But if you know what you're doing, they're very simple and they're very easy. Um, as are all of the things on this show. Remember the three key words today. Do difficult things. Uh, go off now, find some hard things to do, and it will put you in the top 5%. Thanks for listening and or watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>